This technically, this portion starts in verse 2, 22 2 in our Bibles. Um, but really, I, I usually add 22 1 because it, it's relevant to the previous section. It's also relevant to this section. And there's a bizarre thing that happens here in the, in the Hebrew language when it gets translated into English. And that is very often their struggle with how to translate it. And it gets translated all sorts of ways. And so um, I just challenge you to look at your Bibles and see um, how, how it's translated. Because a lot of them, quite honestly, are messed up. It says the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan. And then it goes crazy. Some of them say by Jericho. Some of them say, um, I think the, the New King James does a pretty good job um, across from Jericho. But basically, where are they? They're still, they have not crossed. You know, we've been following this story. They're still, uh, they have not come into the land. When you cross the Jericho, I'm across the Jericho. I said that like three times, didn't I? I'm looking at the words why it's coming out of my mouth. When you cross the Jordan, you're in Israel. Okay, you're in the promised land. And they haven't crossed yet. I mean, we're in book of Numbers. They don't cross till after the Deuteronomy. You know, right at Deuteronomy, they're standing there looking in the land. So obviously, they're not in, they're not by Jericho. But what it's trying to say is they're kind of in an unusual place in that they have come pretty far north. North of Moab. Moab is the mountains. It's along the eastern side of the Dead Sea. At the Ammon and Moab. And they're divided by the Arnon River, which is sort of, there's a, it's a it's kind of a stream. It's still there today. Um, and that divides our, uh, Moab there. And they're to the north. They're, what he's trying to say is they're even north of that. And his place call is translated, it says the steppes of Moab. And that's where these mountains kind of come down and make these plateaus. It's farmland today. And it's basically, if you drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho, which you don't want to go into, um, but you looked across the Jordan, you would be looking at these flat places. You can see it on Google Earth. You'll see these places where there's kind of steps. It literally looks like steps. And there's big, big, big giant farms on these flat steps. It's interesting geography there. That's where they are. And so it's really trying to say they were across from Jericho. Some of them will say on this side. We go, okay, well, uh, who's writing it? You know, it depends. And then originally it was. It was written on this side of the Jericho. Okay, I mean, I've done it again. I'm, I'm inventing a new river, the Jericho River. Um, it would have been on this side, meaning on the eastern side of the Jordan, because that's where all this is taking place. That's where it's being written down. But then a lot of them corrected it once they were in, in the promised land because it made no sense. It was like, on this, they're reading it going on this side of the Jordan, and they're going, no, that's the other side now. So it got corrected. So it's a, it, the translators, this is one of the things they run into, is like, is it more important to make it literal, or is it more important to let you understand it? Personally, I think it's more important to make it understand it, unless it has critical prophetic meaning. So, just be aware of that. If it's saying on this side of the Jordan, that was at that time when it was being write, written. And I think, does King James have that? American Standard? Maybe a couple of the literal ones have that. So, just be careful understanding if they're not by Jordan. I mean, they're, now I've got a new city called Jordan. Um, they're not by Jericho. Um, they're across the Jordan from Jericho. And so since I'm tongue-tied, I'll let you read. Starting at verse 2. <laughs> Starting at verse 2. Okay. <clears throat> and Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will now lick up all that is around us, as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of Ammah, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now and curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Keep going. Mm -hmm. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed from 
departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come and curse them for me. Perhaps I should be able to fight against them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again, Balak sent princes more in number and more honorable than these, and they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor, and whatever you say to me I will do. Come curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. Stop right there. Okay. Um, I want, this is, there's so much going on here that I think I want to kind of read the whole story and then we'll talk about it. Because you're going to get one picture when you read it and you're going to get a different picture when we look at it in depth. The, but the whole picture's here. Um, you want to keep going? You want me to read or you want somebody else to read? I can keep going. Okay. Finish the, keep, go ahead. Uh, yeah, finish the chapter. Where did I stop? Um, Do less or more. Yeah, you're on 19. 19. Mm -hmm. So you two please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. The angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you, because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from you, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went out with the princes of Balak. When Balak heard that Balaam had come, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab on the border formed by the Arnon, at the extremity of the border. Balak said to Balaam, Do I not send to you to call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, Behold, I have come to you. Have I now any power of my own to speak anything? 
the word that God puts in my mouth, that must I speak. And then Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kiriath Huzoth. And Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep, and sent for Balaam and for the princes who were with him. And in the morning Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the Bamoth Baal, and from there he saw a fraction of the people. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, good job. Yep. Am I done? Yep. yep. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Ah, oh, wow. <clears throat> so is this a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> you know, he, he pronounces, you know, when he starts pronouncing this blessing in the, in the next chapter, it is one of the most profound blessings that we see. It is, it is so... Is it in the next chapter? When he ultimately, I think it's chapter, it's chapter 24, when he finally blesses them. It is such a profound blessing that we actually use it at, at Passover. Um, it's called Mato Vu, uh, 24-5. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings Israel, like the valleys that stretch out, gardens by the riverside, uh, Mato Vu. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's interesting, I think... He's an interesting character. Um, when you first read it and you read through, you really can't tell really who he is. Um, and the reason we can't tell, there's a couple of clues. And I've always found it fascinating that, that this guy, that a donkey starts speaking to him. And you notice he don't even miss a beat. He just gets in an argument with the donkey. He don't go, wow, this is a donkey talking. Oh my goodness. He just starts talking to him. That's actually a clue. That's actually a clue as to who this guy is. Go ahead, Richard. Two things. That messenger from Jehovah mm -hmm. was Jehovah because he accepted worship from Balaam. And the other thing is, is if that prophet had had a military or disciplined background, he would have never sought permission to go again. He'd have stood with the word that he had originally to not go with them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. I, w I will add that what we see is um, angel of the Lord when you see that phrase, it's a physical presence of something of a, of a divine messenger but when you see him, you can tell very often that he accepts worship he very often, when you see that phrase, angel of the Lord, and I won't say every time, but it literally in Hebrew means messenger of Yahweh. And so it's difficult to tell who it is until we see him accepting worship or when he just gets in the first person and says, I will curse you, I will kick you out of the land, I will destroy you, or I will save you, or I'm your salvation. Then we go, whoa, okay. So who is God in a physical presence? You know, these sinners, I mean, everybody in these stories are sinners, aren't standing in the unmasked glory of Yahweh Elohim Zevoot, okay? The Lord God Almighty. They're standing in a physical presence of a divine being who is God in the flesh. You figure it out. Go ahead. So, I'm sure this question's been asked before, but I've always wondered why in verse 20 does he tell Balaam to go? And then he gets angry, he went, and then after he's angry, he tells him to go again. Yeah, okay. We, we will get to that. We will. That's an excellent question. I will work on that question. And I, I think another clue is, in the very end of what you were reading, it says, Baal. He goes up to the mountains or the high places of Baal to mm -hmm. look down. Well, yep. Baal is the devil. Well, it's... Isn't he? Or some... It's, it's actually in this context, and it's important that you brought that up because people get their uh, bees in their bonnet and their wig on too tight about this issue. Um, Baal, is, it, it, it can literally mean Lord or Master, but don't confuse that with the word that when we're calling God Master or Lord or Yeshua Lord, those are different words. That's Adonai, which is not the same as Adon, which is my Lord, you would call... Um, uh, Abraham, Sarah called Abraham my Lord, Adon, but it's Adonai is the Hebrew word for calling God Lord. What it means is Baal or Baal 
is actually the name of a Phoenician deity. It's the primary Phoenician deity and it is a kind of a generic term. It's not a proper noun but they use it like a proper noun just like very often when we refer to Yahweh we call him God. And it's very interesting to note and again um, I, I, I tell people that we really it's really 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 important to find balance. It's real easy to go onto the electronic tree of the knowledge of good and evil and uh, and absorb all the evil that's actually on the internet and all the um, these supposed geniuses out there who haven't a clue what they're talking about and they lead a lot of people astray. Right here in this portion you've got the Bible calling right here in the section that he just read you've got the Bible calling back to back Yahweh and God. You're gonna see that throughout this section where God is called he'll be called God in one place and Yahweh in the next verse and Yah God in the next one and so it's acknowledged he has a personal name but we also know that he is Elohim, you know, the Almighty. And um, so, um, I don't know. Oh, so what we're going to see also is as we start to sort out who um, Balaam really is, it is interesting, so watch as we're reading the next section, that he keeps going up to these high places of Baal and doing sacrifices. And my question is, uh, who are they sacrificing to? They went to the high places of Baal and they're sacrificing. And it, you'll, you'll slowly start to see who, this, who he really is. He's an interesting character. He's not full-blown pagan and he's not, he's not full-blown Yahweh. But he says, and he's going to say, and I want you to look for this. He says, Yahweh is my God. So he's an interesting, in, that makes him even more interesting. Uh, right? Yes, Wayne. Uh, in verse 20. The, the, the word that always stuck out to me as why God got angry with him is that word if. He said, if the men come to you, go with them. He just got up and went. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really indicate that he waited for them to come. He just got up and went to them and went. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Yep. And um, the uh, thing with Balaam um, that always kind of... It's, he's one of the. He obviously knows God. That the God talks to him, and uh, so he's aware of spiritual stuff. Mm -hmm. But he always seems to want to. He's always in his flesh. Mm -hmm. He's always uh, looking for the, the a way to get around God's word. That's a character that I. A, a, yeah. Not a character. What do you? A trait that I've noticed about him mm -hmm. is that uh, whoever he is. Mm -hmm. He's looking for that loophole. Yeah, I'm glad we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, ever, ever, you ever look for a loophole? I know it's Shabbat, but... <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Balaam is an interesting guy. Um... I'm, I'm going to assume that he must have been a prophet of some kind because the king would go to him to have him intervene or curse um, God's people. Mm -hmm. So he certainly was well known. He had a, had a reputation for sure. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm assuming that at some point for the king to request his services, he had to have had... Mm -hmm. some relationship with the Almighty mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, what was the spiritual condition of the Israelites, because I don't get a feel for that, at the time when uh, this man requested for his people to be cursed? Okay. I would assume that it must have been good. It, and I uh, guess my second question would be, does God allow, does the Almighty allow for his people to be cursed? Or is that something that only he can do? That's a great question. Um, and I'm going to not answer it right at this moment because the word's going to answer those questions. I want you to just watch for it. It's gonna, and we will address it, but it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to talk about that. Another clue, I think, is it says God planted cedar trees along the Jordan. Now, the devil worshippers uh, usually went to the high places among the evergreen, evergreen trees in their groves. So mm -hmm. for God to plant evergreen tree along the river was... It's in the bay, it's in the valley. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, that's a... Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, 
There's too okay. many you know. <laughs> So Similarity. I'm a, let's go. Um, let's go one more. Let's go one more section, uh, and then and then we, we're not going to lose any of those questions. We're going to back up. But I just I want you to just keep seeing this picture. Let's, let's keep drawing the picture for a second. Okay. Um, and then and then Rodney, did you have one? Okay. Um, all right. So so they in, in verse 40, sort of right there. So we start right before 23. Um, it says that Balak offers. Um, notice he has the king. This is not Balaam, the, the prophet, the sorcerer, the whatever he is, the interesting guy. He's having, I thought it was interesting that Balaam has the king, Balak, do the offerings. Well, so who would he be offering to? There's just a thought. Just who, would, who would this king be offering him to? Because he's kind of basically a pagan king. 41, and it's the next day, and um, um, Balak took Balaam, so the king takes Balaam and brings him up to these high places of Baal. And then in 23.1 it says, And Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare me seven bulls, seven rams, and Balak, the king. Their names are similar, so I'll just say that occasionally so you don't get mixed up. And Balak, the king, did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak, the king, and Balaam, down there together, offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And Balaam said to Balak the king, stand, so he's telling the king, stand by your burnt offering and I will go and perhaps Yahweh will come and meet me and whatever he shows me I will tell you. So he went to a deserted height. He goes to a desolate place. All of this is bizarre behavior to be biblical. You know, It's really strange. That's verse 3. And Yahweh and, and God, and so he said, there's, there's an example of that. Verse 3, it calls, it, he says, perhaps Yahweh will speak to me. Verse 4, and God met Balaam, and he said to him, I have prepared the seven, I have, he's saying to God, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered on each altar a bull and ram. And then Yahweh put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balak the king, and thus you shall speak. He tells him what to say. And he returns, verse 6, and he's, the king stand there by his burnt offerings. Him and all the princes of Moab, the, meaning, you know, all the royalty. Um, and verse 7, it says, and he took up his prophetic discourse, is kind of what the Hebrew word means. It's sometimes translated oracle, but it's more just prophecy. And, he's, he starts, and he starts speaking. This is what that Yahweh told him to speak. He said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from... Aram from the mountains of the east come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel how shall I curse whom God has not cursed and how shall I denounce whom Yahweh has not denounced there again he's used God's putting that uh, this is really important people get I'm just pausing here because um, a lot of stuff on the internet about you know you can't call him Elohim you can't call him Yahweh whatever this is not about pronunciation. This is about revelation. This is about who you know, not what, how you say it. Okay? And this is a classic example of where the Bible does that. And it specifically says here that Yahweh put this in his mouth. Okay? So go argue with God about that if you've got an issue. Um, verse 9. For from the top of the rocks I see him. From the hills I behold him. He's talking about Israel. He's up on the top. Remember he went up high. And so he's looking down. There. A people dwelling alone. Not reckoning itself among the nations. Not considering itself one of the nations. No. They're alone. Who can count the dust or the ashes? In other words the, the number. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Or the number even a fourth of them? Um... Or the stock of them. There's a lot that's as an Aramaic phrase right there that makes it difficult to translate. It can mean the stock. It can mean one fourth. It can mean the ashes. Um, it's a little struggle in translation right there in verse ten. Um, and then this is real cool. Look what Balaam says. So after he says that, he says, "Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his." Wow. That's pretty powerful. I mean, you got this weird guy who goes, you know what, when I die, I want to die like they do. So he, you're right. He does know who they are. He knows who they are. He knows who God is. He's always putting words in his mouth. But yet, he's trying to curse Israel. He isn't. He said, I can't curse them, but let's, let's keep going a minute. Then the king says to Balaam, verse 11, 
What, have you, what did you just do? <laughs> I took you to curse my enemies and you have blessed them bountifully. So Esther said, I can only say what Yahweh has put in my mouth. And then the king says to him, here, let me take you to another place so you can see them and you will see only the outer part of them and you, you won't have to see them all. You just look at the edge of them and maybe from there you can curse them. Verse, yeah, I'm like paraphrasing. Verse 14. So he brings them to the field of Zohim, Zophim, sorry, on the top of Bis Pisgah and builds seven altars, offers seven bulls and rams on each altar and says to the king, stand here by your burnt offering while I meet with Yahweh over, and love King James here, while I meet with Yahweh over yonder. Okay, so keep telling my wife from Pennsylvania that that is a biblical word. And here's where it is. Over, yonder's a biblical word, so it's just it's not just a southern word. That proved that actually proved that God is southern. It's over yonder. It's not here. It's yonder. There's here and there's yonder. It's two different places. <laughs> Verse sixteen. Keep going. And Yahweh met with Balaam. Okay, there we go. Verse sixteen. Yahweh meets with this guy, puts a word in his mouth. Verse sixteen. And says, go back to the king Balak, and this you shall speak. And so he goes back, and he, they, he's standing by his offerings with the princes. And Balak said to him, what has Yahweh spoken? So these guys, this is what's fascinating to me. These guys know Yahweh. They know who he is. He know, he's like, and once again, verse 18, he takes up, Balaam takes up his oracle or his prophetic discourse. And he says, rise up, Balak, and hear me, Shema. Listen to me, son of Zephor. God is not a man that he should lie. Nor the son of man that he should nacham. It's translated repent. That he should change his mind. That he says, oh, I shouldn't have done that and changed his mind. Okay, that's what it means. Um, he, what he has said, will he not do it? Or what he has spoken, will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot reverse it. He has, this answers your question right here, 21. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob. He calls it, didn't call him Jacob, Israel, he calls him Jacob. He's talking over the flesh. I have, he ha, God has not seen sin in their flesh, even as a, spirit, as a physical man. Nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. In other words, as individuals, as a nation, they're being obedient. Yahweh, his Elohim, is with him, and the shout of a king is among him. Okay? God brings him out of Egypt. He has the strength of a wild ox. Here he goes. Like, sit, sit down, Balak. He has the strength of a wild ox, for there is no sorcery against Jacob. There is no divination against Israel. It must now be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts, up, lifts itself up like a lion. It shall not lie down. It shall devour its prey and it drinks the blood of the slain. Then the king says to Balaam, Dude, I'm just about done with you. It's like, don't curse him, don't bless him, just shut up. <laughs> He's just like, stop, just stop. 26. Balaam answered said, I done told you. I can only say what Yahweh speaks. That, and that's what I have to do. Or 27. And then Balak says to Balaam, please, come. I just need to take you to a better place. You're just not in the right place. I'll get you to the right place and you're going to be able to do... This, this guy's desperate, isn't he? <laughs> it's like, how many times? He... <laughs> it's like, let me just keep trying. I'll just keep trying. So the king takes him to the top of Peor that overlooks the... the it's translated wasteland sometimes. It's like... Um, Hebrew word there is Yeshimon. Um, but the wilderness, okay, the wilderness, that's a good place. But that's actually where they are. <laughs> and, 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 and if he's not looking at all of Israel, then he's going to, you know, he's looking over that whole area there. Then Balaam says to Balak, build seven altars. You know the story. Put seven bulls, seven rams. Verse 30. And so they did that. Chapter 24. Now Balaam saw that it pleased Yahweh to bless Israel. And he did not go as at other times. Pay close attention to that phrase. Okay, this, the, 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 the weird guy here, Balaam, gets that Yahweh wants to bless Israel. And he did not go as at other times to seek to use... What words do y'all have there? 
omens, enchantment. What was that? Sorcery. Sorcery. Aha. Uh -huh. What's really going on? Did you notice every time that they built altars, he has the king build an altar and then he goes somewhere else and does weird, some kind of weird stuff, but inquires of Yahweh using weird stuff. Okay? And Balaam raised his eyes and he sees Israel camped according to the tribes. And the Spirit of Yahweh came up, the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his oracle and he said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes were opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and sees the wisdom of the Almighty, who falls down with his eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. Like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by Yahweh, like the cedars beside the waters. He shall pour water from his buckets and his seed shall be on many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength as a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with his arrows. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him up? Blessed is he who bless you. And cursed is he who curses you. I'm going to stop right there. This guy is still absolutely bizarre. Go ahead. <laughs> What's your question? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm of the belief that if there's a word in the Torah that's written there, then God put it there for some reason. Oh, absolutely. So, um, going back to the donkey and the, the fact that he was stricken three times, is there a meaning to that three? I, I, it just occurred to me. I, I didn't, where, where, didn't get a chance Where to, is it? When the when Balaam uh, hit the donkey, oh, oh the donkey, the donkey, right, gotcha, 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 gotcha. So, okay. um, yeah. I didn't count how many times he's already gone through, you know, uh, mm -hmm. advisement mm -hmm. from the Almighty. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think it's uh, three strikes and you're out kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I I want to know that's is there good, any meaning to that three? That's a good in question. There? That's a good question. And then my husband wanted to ask. Was uh, this guy of an Israelite, or we just don't know? He's not an Israelite. Let's look at. Let's back up. I said I would back up, so let me back up and and just share some stuff. Um, if you just look on Strong's or something, and and there's even a few translations, very, you know, transliterations that will transliterate his name a couple of times. What does Balaam mean? Anybody know? Not of the people. So it, it literally means, if we look at it literally in Hebrew, it means not of the people. Baal Am, not of the people. And that's kind of how you would translate it. But the problem is, they don't think that's what the word was used. I'm going to go one more step. I'm going to back up. Do you know what his dad's name was? Beor? Beor? What does it mean? The burning. Burning. It means burning. This guy's name is burning. Go ahead. Uh, you did. You have showed us in the past how far he had to travel to get where he was. Oh and yeah. That he he Great he point. did not even live anywhere Any, near where, where they that, were. That's a good point. He Thank he you. he lived way off. He basically lived near where Abraham came from. I mean, this dude came from a long ways, which tells us that he was very very famous. Even the city he lived in was very famous. It mentions the name of the city, Pethor. Now, now it's starting to get interesting. Anybody know what Pethor means? Pethor means soothsayer. This dude lives in a town that's called Soothsayer. His dad's name is Burning. And his name, if you look at it, according to some scholars that that I really like and, and trust. It's a play. It's not literally what it, it's not really not of the people. It actually means destroyer, Wayne. You're correct. It means destroyer. What does? Balaam. Yeah, and I can show you in the Hebrew why they say that. 
It's, it's, a, it's a slight alteration. It's like a play on words. And I'm going to show you another interesting. Peter does an interesting play on his word, on his name too. And I'll, we'll look at that one second. Don't let me forget to do that. So, um, Balak, um, Balak's name is another interesting name. Balak is devastator. It's like, who are these people? These are not like son of El or, you know, son of Yah or all the cool names that the children of Israel have. It's like, these dudes all have demonic names. They all have this, this whole thing. You can see they're basically, um, so Balak, Balak is devastator, okay? Um, Balaam, meaning destroyer, which is a name basically that a wizard would have. They basically... Um, I think he was a, a wizard. And why, I mean, he lives in Mesopotamia. He says where he comes from. So he's all the way over, like, f f you know, he is, I'm trying to think how you could even get there from where they are. You, you can't get there from here. You got to go where, I mean, this guy lives weeks and weeks away by foot. I mean, it's almost, it's, it's as far it's as far from where he lives to where they are as it is from where they are back to Egypt. Or even from the Jordan back, yeah, they're at the Jordan now, back to Egypt. I mean, it's, it's that far away. It's about equally, about equal the same distance. And I'm just kind of picturing. So he, this is not some local guy. This guy is super famous. He comes from a super famous town, they believe, of, you know, of, of wizards. I mean, it's kind of like we got a town down the road. I won't yeah. toot its horn too much with that, that has that fame all over the nation, all over the world, okay? Because that's who lives there, a bunch of devil worshipers. Um, uh, I'm surprised you don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, the, uh, yeah, cast a devil. <laughs> um, and so, so this guy, his dad's called the Burning you know, the burning, and from the town of Soothsayer, and his son's name um, is, you know, devourer, destroyer, you know, he, he's, he's, his name. So, what's interesting is that in the midst of this, now, John read something very interesting. He comes, he, he gets, uh, first of all, what Wayne said was very interesting. When he brings up that, that God says, if the men come, in verse 20, 22, 20, then you go with them. 21, Balaam got up in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princess. It didn't say they came. So he's like, first of all, what was it they were offering him? Money, fame, power, the things that flesh wants, right? They're offering him all that. And so... You know, so he's like, I'm not going to miss out on this opportunity, okay? And, and in verse 22, look what it says. God's anger was aroused because he went. So somebody had, I think Dean had that question. I was like, how you tell him to go? And then it's subtle. You got to look for the details. God says, if they come and call on you, and there's no evidence they did that. He just got up. Says, Balaam got rose in the morning and saddled his donkey. And, Let's go, you know. He went with him. Um... Well, exactly. Exactly. A good point. That, you know, he took that like, well, that's close enough. We've got to be careful, you know, when we're adding to or bending the word to make it fit. And instantly, the very next thing we see, so he gets up and he's being presumptuous, basically. They didn't come out. It didn't matter. I mean, you don't care if I go. I'll go anyway. It's no big deal. God's anger is aroused. So you bam, bam, bam. You see, the, see what's going on? So this guy's getting his desires, his flesh, his wants in front of Yahweh's instructions, okay? And so the Lord says, Yahweh took a stand as the adversary against him. It's not mincing words about who this is. This is a divine being. The other thing is very interesting. He has this problem with the donkey. And, and honestly, I was just thinking about the three strikes thing. And I, I've never really heard any explanation about that. So I don't know. You figure that one out and you let me know what it is. Okay. Um, I'm trying to, I was in the back of my mind, I'm trying to relate it to, okay, Moses hits the rock twice. And that was messed up. But I don't know about the donkey. Um, what's interesting, if you think about it, if he really is a sorcerer, if he really is a wizard, and he's used to that 
realm, demonic realm and spirit realm and whatever, when the donkey starts talking to him, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. That's why he, did, he, just, he just starts arguing with it. It's, he knows it's a spirit and he don't really care. You know, he knows some spirits like, I mean, in his world, that's probably normal, you know. And I mean, I've always thought that's just kind of strange. But when you realize who he is, so Yahweh opens his mouth. He says, what have I done? Balaam's like, you, you abused me. What is, what is, I'm looking at, what is that word there? You mocked me. <laughs> He's like, you mocked me. You made fun of me. If I had a sword on my hand, I'd kill you right now. That's very interesting. He's on his way. He's, he's bad, right? Balaam's bad. He's, 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 the, he's the destroyer. He's on his way to try to destroy Israel with the words of his mouth. But yet he needs a sword to attack a donkey. Why can't he just curse the donkey and he fall over? I mean, uh, if you truly have power, like Yeshua says to the fig tree, it's like, you're cursed and it just dies. <laughs> it's like, if he really had power, he, he wouldn't have needed a sword. And I wish the donkey had said to that. If you're really as bad as everybody says you are, you wouldn't need a sword. <laughs> but, but he already thinks the donkey's mocking him. But he says, uh, you know, I'd kill you right now. But you know, okay, you can't do that. But now you think you're going to go curse Israel. Really? That, how's that going to happen? And the donkey says, I'm having not done all this. I've been all this good. You know, and he said, you had done nothing wrong. And, you know, and then he sees this angel of Yahweh standing there. And uh, this is very interesting. Because in verse 31, I'm in 2231. Um, Yahweh opens Balaam's eyes. And we see that various places in scripture where God opens somebody's eyes and they see the spirit realm. By the way, as a general rule, you're not supposed to see the spirit realm. If you're seeing, I'm just, this is a caveat for anybody. If you're seeing the spirit realm all the time, and there's people that do, so you're seeing this and this and this, um, you need to come talk to me. you got something going on we need to deal with, okay? It, it's more serious than you think. Just, if, if, uh, the other thing too, if you're hearing it all the time, and we're going to see a little of that, I think, in this portion. Um... If you're hearing it all the time, I mean, we'll talk about more of that later. But especially if you're seeing it, that needs to be dealt with right away. Um, that's not good. That is not good. Okay. Um, Yahweh opens his eyes. If Yahweh opens your eyes, Yahweh opens Moshe's eyes, and it's, you know, and he sees the, what does he see? He sees the angels of God. He don't see him open his eyes and see demons. You see, when God opens people's eyes, they see the army of the Lord. Okay. And it empowers them to keep doing, to keep hanging on, to keep doing whatever they need to do. So he opens his eyes, he sees the angel, the messenger of Yahweh, you know, God in the flesh, Yeshua. He bows his head, he falls on his face. He knows this guy knows who God is. And the angel Yahweh 32 says, why did you hit the donkey? I've come out to stand as against you as an adversary because your way is perverse, perverted, disgusting before me. Okay? So, what's he doing? Well, we've seen he was being presumptuous. So, what this guy is about, you know, it's like, he's like, well, I heard that guy say something, I don't know, he's, he does this wrong and he does that wrong, it can't be true. Yahweh's speaking through a wizard right here. I mean, just a straight up. He's speaking through a donkey. You know, it's like, you know, you see that, some preachers go, that guy's such a donkey. They wouldn't use that word. But, it's like, that that's, that's not new. Huh? Wouldn't that be, when he said that, wouldn't that be like, the, the like I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. He didn't. He stopped. He didn't. He stopped. And he said, uh, um, Balaam says, verse 34, Balaam actually realizes who's God standing there. And Balaam says to the angel Yahweh, I have sinned. I did not know you stood in the way against me. Therefore, if it displeases you, um, or if it's evil in your eyes, a little more literal translation there, if it's, if it's evil, what I'm doing, I'll turn back. And then the angel Yahweh says to Balaam, Go with them. 
go with the men, but only speak the word that I speak to you. So he keeps going. So something, God knows his heart. God knows this guy's heart. God knows this guy's motivation. He knows his background. Now this is very interesting because I think, I think this guy is having a moment. Yes, he's been a wizard. Yes, he's got an ugly background. Yes, he's very famous. Okay? Comes from a family of wizards, apparently. From a town of wizards. But he's standing here having a conversation with God. Learning. So he's going to have an opportunity here. I mean, anybody can be redeemed, right? He hasn't blasphemed the Holy Spirit. If he was, he wouldn't be hearing the Spirit of God. Once you do that, you don't hear it. So all I hear, all these people used to come to me and I was preaching in prison. Oh, I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. I feel so bad and I can't be saved. And no, no, no. I said, no, you haven't. You don't even have to tell me anything more. No, you haven't. How do you know I haven't? I said all these bad... I don't care. You haven't. You wouldn't be repenting. You wouldn't feel sorry. You'd be saying it was the best thing you ever did. So you'd be calling good evil and evil good. So it's real easy to see where people are. Okay? So, so God is, has seen what is in this guy's heart. And so what's happening is he is motivated by power, by money, by fame, by I want to do it my way. You can't do it your way. You've got to do it Yahweh's way. Okay? So... Um, I think right here, I'm going to share something with you. Because it, it actually comes from 2 Peter. Um, Peter talks about this guy. The, the Bible talks about this guy a lot. You do a search for Balaam, you're going to see that he's mentioned throughout Scripture. I mean, they mention him over and over and over. Moses talks about him in Deuteronomy. and Deuteronomy. Um, De Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. For new people, I'm, I'm using Hebrew words and, and English words. The book of Numbers is, is called the Midbar. It's literally in Hebrew. It means in the wilderness. Because they're in the wilderness. When this happens in the book of Deuteronomy. It's called Devrim. Which means words. Moshe's words that he spoke to all of Israel. Right before they went into the land. Um, First Peter chapter 2. Let's just go there right now. While we're looking at this crazy guy. No we're going to start in verse 1. Quit messing with me. <laughs> Angel of the Lord going to jump out with a donkey. You better be careful. First, what did I say? Second Peter? Second Peter 2. Uh, second Peter is what I meant to say. 2 Peter. Second Peter 2. I saw I'm, I'm less dexic sometimes. I see things backwards. Even say them backwards. Um, um, so it, it da, 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 let's see where we'll start here um, second Peter 2 yeah it, I want to start in verse 1 because it talks there it says uh, we got it up yeah false prophets so there are also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who brought them and bring themselves to swift destruction. Um, by covetousness, verse 3, it's covet, you know, they're coveting, they're going to uh, exploit you with deceptive words. Um, um, if God didn't spare the angels, because he doesn't spare the fallen angels, uh, verse 4, Five, let's see, da, 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 Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 6. You know, he's just talking about all the places that God didn't spare. Um, verse 9, and Yahweh knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment, especially those who walk according to the flesh, verse 10, of uncleanliness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed, and not afraid to speak evil against mm, uh, dignit, d dignitaries, yeah, yeah, Jude chapter 8 does too. Um, whereas, uh, let's see, verse 12, let's look at 12. But these like brute beasts um, may be caught, may be destroyed, speak evil against the things they don't understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. They will receive the wages of the unrighteous as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime, um, pointing out people's spots and blemishes um, while ignoring their own deceptions while they feast with you. Now that gets translated a couple of different ways depending on the translation. 
Um, but if you look close in the King James and New King James, the they are in the second sentence spots is added. Both those words are added and they are wrong. Okay, they should not be there. It's, um, they're not the spots. They're pointing out the spots and blemishes while they feast with you. Verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable soul. They have hearts trained in covetous practices. They are an accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who love the wages of unrighteousness. So Peter kind of tells us what's going on. Verse 16 it says, But he was rebuked for his iniquity, a mute or dumb donkey. That means not a smart, it means dumb as in he couldn't speak. A dumb as in can't speak donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. Okay. Now, I'm guessing that verse 16 in some other translations has a different word than prophet. No? Okay. Okay. All right. Let me back up and share a couple things. Um, how about in verse 15? Balaam, the son of... His, now, we know his real name was Beor. 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 I'm sorry. I keep saying it wrong. It's Beor. Does somebody have a different word there? Bosor. Which is interesting. Peter's playing, it's actually a word play and, and people miss it. He's, he's, it's translated here in Greek so it just gets put Bosor and they just say, okay, that's, that's just the name of Beor. It's not. It's a word play in Hebrew because it's a play on, the, on a word that basically means flesh. The Hebrew word that sounds like uh, Bosor can mean flesh, like you're of the flesh. And so... Peter's actually mocking him here. He's like, he's calling himself son of the flame, okay? He's the son of the flesh. That's what he really is. And this, so, so Peter's really mocking him there. That's kind of what that is. Um, so basically what it's talking about here is that there are, you know, there are faults. And I'm telling you, probably today, I don't know if it's worse than any time in history, but it's really, really bad with the with the internet it's just opened the door for every false teacher out there to you know proclaim whatever and um, and heresies and you know it says in verse 1 there it says there are false prophets among the people false teachers among you bring in destructive heresies the problem is very often it's it's usually mixed and it sounds good um, um, and and two, in verse 12 there, basically these, these people, and in some translations it literally says these people, okay? I like, I like other translations better than the New King James here on that particular one. Um, it says these people are pointing out the sins of others, and in the process of that, following the way of Balaam, they're pointing out the sins of others which causes them not to see their own sins. This is a classic play of the devil. If he can get somebody to look in at everybody else's sin, oh, he's doing this, and he, she's doing that, and there's a person doing that, and this person doing that. All of a sudden, that takes, that just moves the camera to out there, and their focus becomes out there instead of here. Where's our focus supposed to be? It's supposed to be on us and him. Okay? If we have that focus, we won't have the problem. Go ahead, Wayne. I see you got mine. Oh, I'm just, Balaam is a type of shadow. He's a type of shadow of the enemy, and it's that pattern. And what God is, I think, ultimately showing us for this scripture to be in is that no one can snatch us out of his hand. We cannot be defiled by others or by Satan or by Baal or by any demon or any evil thing. Ultimately, if we follow this story out, and I don't want to give it away because I don't know where you're going with it, but... <laughs> I don't either. It, we'll find out. <laughs> but it's, it's when we choose to come into agreement with the curse. Mm -hmm. When we eat the fruit anyway. Mm -hmm. When we do that contrary to what God says brings the curse into us, brings judgment into us, gives 
It's not the power of Satan. Right. It's not the power of Baal. Nope. It's As we see through the story, can Baal, I, can can't, I use a word Baal can't say anything that God doesn't allow him to say. You can't curse what God has blessed. Mm -hmm. And he says that we're a sekul, but, a but special... where is the power there? The power is our tongue. What we do. Well, they're we, in like, let's make them, let's make man in our image. Mm -hmm. There it goes all and the so way back get to that. To, it does. And we, so we're the one, the, the enemy can't do it, but we can, we can choose that. You know, we can, in other words, and one of the things I keep telling people is we never <laughs> lose our ability to choose. I really think this was Balaam's opportunity to repent and know God. I mean, I can't imagine that he's, had a, uh, he's ever had a more powerful encounter with Yahweh than this encounter where he goes up and he actually desires, he knows he's going to get paid a bunch of money if, if he can curse Israel and he can't. Go ahead. I have a thought nagging me in my mind right now. Um, I listen to all these stories, you know, that are in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And they're there for us today. That's about where I'm going right if now. If God, okay, <laughs> if, 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 if the Almighty leaves these things for, for us today, mm -hmm. I guess my burning question is the following. If Israel, I'm talking about the literal country of Israel today, mm -hmm. who are planning on, on creating or building this temple at some point, mm -hmm. but if their hearts are not well with the Almighty, mm -hmm. if in the country of Israel, in Jerusalem, we see sins of all kind, mm -hmm. and their hearts are not being drawn to the truth and to the Almighty, then how can God bless them and not curse them? Or am I missing something here? Yeah. Remember, you know the rest of the story as a prophecy that gets the fire again. Yeah, the, um, the, go ahead, Mike. The, the rest of that prophecy is when they build this temple or they build, more importantly, they build this altar because it's the altar that gets defiled. I don't know that they actually get to build the whole temple. It's yeah. yet to be seen. It, I don't know. Yeah. Before but that altar will be defiled by the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So it's a, another, op, maybe that's their last opportunity to realize that not by their will, but by God's right. will, that their Messiah is Yeshua mm -hmm. and, and, and that's where that will ultimately go mm -hmm. that uh, until they see their eyes until that blinder has been lifted yep. from their eyes yep. and they can see well, Mashiach mm -hmm. for who he is now, we it's kind of hard it's kind of hard to play even with all their heart they're trying to play the game as well as they could possibly play it but they're obviously not even in the game because they don't have mm -hmm. Mashiach. We have to be very, very careful on this subject because do not forget who blinded Israel. That's exactly right. Yeshua said to Israel, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. Who blinded him? They had a reason. And as a okay. Fryam, it's not That's our place to judge Judah. Our place is to uh, and so it's a period. assist it's a them and period. to, you know, how long was our eyes blinded to his Torah? Yeah. All of Israel is blinded in part. All of Israel. Who's all of Israel? Okay, both sides of this story. Physical Israel, spiritual Israel, those who are in the land, those who are out of the land, the lost tribes, the, the grafted tribes, the, all that. All of Israel is blinded in part. You know, we, we saw Messiah forever. We didn't see the Torah. They see the Torah forever. They don't see Messiah. Blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles that come in. And there's all, as the Gentiles, as the nations, another translation of that word, as they come into, or grafted into Israel, there's a point where what's very interesting is the first, the second song that we sang with a really upbeat praise with a bunch of Jewish worshipers, that was filmed in downtown Jerusalem. There's an awakening going on over there that may even be 
it certainly rivals what's going on here. It certainly rivals what's going on here. So that we're right at that point where whatever the shift is being made, that generation, okay, and those are like the uh, the, the, the Thirty-year-olds, thirty-five-year-olds, and younger. That generation has a completely different view than the generation that came into the land. The generation that came into the land of Israel had seen war their entire life. Okay, they didn't strife and war. You know, World War Two. I mean, they left for all, and they, they're like, they're done. Don't want anything. We just didn't do what we did, and we just gonna praise God and you just do the Torah, and that's it. The young generation didn't grow up in that. They grew up in something else. They, they're standing strong for Israel. They're ready to go to war. The, the older generation is like, I don't want no more war. Please, give away the land. Give it, just do whatever you got to do. Just, we don't want war. I get it. They've been war their whole life. The younger generation is like, I literally had a guy one day. I'm trying to get to Rachel's tomb. And I'm trying to find the right bus that goes there. And I'm, I'm standing out by the road. And I'm like, it's a bus stop. And a couple of Orthodox guys standing there. And... Um, I said, and I could tell there's like two or three places, and I wasn't sure if I was in the right one, and I couldn't read the sign. And I said to the, one of the Orthodox guys, and he's telling totally everything. I said, you speak English? And he said, yes, I do, and perfect English. And like, he said, I'm, I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from New York. And I was like, okay, you do speak English. <laughs> I said, is this the bus to Rachel's tomb? He said, it depends. I said, oh, on what? He said, I got a question. Okay. He should, and, and it was actually during the time they were giving away the Gaza Strip. He, sh he should, uh, he said, um, should Israel be giving away land for peace? I said, absolutely not. This is God's land. And he got a big smile. So I said, this is the bus. I'll show you the way. <laughs> All right, right over here. Um, as you were saying earlier, I keep seeing how Balaam has choice. Mm -hmm. And um, even if he perceived, where sometimes I have perceived that God's sending me in a direction, doesn't mean it was his timing to send me in that direction. Good point. And um, his point. timing is so perfect and he fulfills exactly what he wants fulfilled in his timing. Yep. He instructs me to stand firm until yep. I get other instruction. Yeah. We can get ahead of God real quick. Um, I mean, I've had that happen so many times in my own life, you know. The way of Balaam is a temptation that I think we rarely, regularly face. I think so. A temptation to get comfortable, a temptation to seek comfort, a temptation to ease up and back up and not fight the good fight. And, and in a way, I think if we yield to that temptation, we start on a path that is similar to the one that we're reading about with Balaam. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be very careful that we're always faithful. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and again, we're, they're really the, the lust the, the is towards just the ways of the world. It can, be, it can be money, it can be power, it can be fame, it can be, you know, of the flesh uh, to any degree. Um, um, dr drugs are even, if you think about it, you know, what is, what is, what's drugs all about? It's about us and our feelings. You know, and that's what the world, if you think about it, the world's been taught, it's about you, it's about you, it's about you, well then why can't I get high and feel like I want to feel? My body, me, 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 you know. <laughs> yeah, but you wreck everybody around you. Go ahead, Wayne. With the Torah portion today and the pattern of, of this and her uh, question about Judah mm -hmm. in those days, I was thinking earlier today and and I don't think it's a quinky dink that in this time, that in this events of the days and where we find ourselves at with prophecy and so forth, mm -hmm. and the events occurring in this nation at this very moment, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a quinky dink that our Independence Day fell on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Good point. So that there is a opportunity. Mm -hmm. To make a choice, to make a distinction. Yep. Imagine if this nation rested today. Wow. That'd be powerful. What if there was a separation between America 
you fry them mm -hmm. in God's word. Mm -hmm. All the demonstrations stop. All the festivity mm -hmm. stop. And the whole nation just mm -hmm. rested as commanded by God, and we mm -hmm. put Him first. Mm -hmm. Just this one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be awesome. I mean, uh, I think it, that yeah, it would be healing. It would be awesome. I, I'm not even, I'm, you know, obviously it's Shabbat. I, I'm not going to obviously watch the news, but it would not surprise me tomorrow mm -hmm. that today, mm -hmm. while we should be resting and mid rushing and and having a holy convocation and fellowship, that there's probably some un godly uh, no doubt. fighting and bitterness and mm -hmm. protesting and all kinds of atrocities happening today. Yep. And this is like a choice with Balaam here and all of us, the whole all of us, here. is mm -hmm. that as far as for me and my house, I serve the Lord today. We have today. to make that choice. Yep. And, make uh, choice. and stand in it. I don't think it's a quinky dink that yeah. it's today. It's a challenge. It's a test. Today's a test. Let me just share one more thing. Don't forget where this guy is. He is in he is trying to put himself in the in the congregation of Israel. He's, you know, trying to deal directly with Israel. Um, when Second Peter, when Peter takes it up and talks about it, he's actually talking about Balaam's who are in the congregations. Okay, so there's, Peter's warning us that there, these same Balaam's having, you know, eyes that, you know, and unstable souls, they have heart trained on covetousness practices, they're accursed children, they've, you know, they're going astray following the way of Balaam, okay. Um, it goes on in verse 18, it says, they speak these great swelling words, everything sounds good, but it's emptiness. Um... And they, they lure people um, away, and it says they've actually es escaped into error. Verse 19, and while these Balaams promise liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also is brought into bondage. Um, and so, like, these, these same people who are promising freedom actually are... And basically, the whole thing is he wants us to realize that there are Balaam's in... I mean, where does the enemy, enemy operate? He comes in the congregation creating problems, right? And um, Titus... Yeah, Titus 3, 9 says, you know, tells us, warns us about that too. Um, he says, uh, avoid foolish controversies, quarrels and fights about the Torah because they are useless and empty. Verse 10, reject a divisive person after two or three, one or two warnings, not two or three, one or two warnings. You know that such a person is twisted by sin and is conscious of it. He knows about it himself. And in 1 Timothy, Paul goes on, um... He's talking about these false, these teachers. Is that they're teaching their own doctrine according to what they're doing. That verse four, they're conceited. They don't know anything, but they're obsessed with arguments, disputes, and word battles. What does the enemy do? What does the enemy do with Yeshua? Gets in this word battle. Oh, you could do this, but he don't do this. And you know, Yeshua has to correct him with the word. So, um, and from these word battles become envy, strife, insult, insults evil suspicions, constant friction of the people of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is some means of gain. Withdraw yourself from such. Um, um, you know, Proverbs 6 says, you know, there are six things Yahweh hates, seven which are an abomination, arrogant eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, and a um, arrogant eyes I'm sorry I lost my place um, a false witness who utters lies and he who sows discord among the brethren okay so um, that's one of the few things that God says he hates and so what we have is a Balaam you, you get two things you've got you got him trying to sow discord he's trying to curse Israel and basically Paul said don't put up with that you know be done with it but the other thing is you have people that will follow that 
false teaching. And I just want to share something that's very popular. I don't know uh, if you've noticed, we've been carving some particular songs out of our worship service um, because of the doctrine behind the people that put them out. And the, probably the number one offender today is, um, who is it? Bethel. Bethel Music, yeah. Bethel there in Redding, California. Um, and I just, a couple of the things that the guy's doing um, this one of the they they he's teaching this doctrine is is based on a it's really cultic it's based on the word of faith movement it's kind of new age metaphysical kind of thing um, teaches very close to Mormonism that we are little gods and that we can speak things into existence and that's like this positive you just speak it and it'll happen you just say it and you believe it and it'll happen there's one being that can speak something and it happens and in the beginning he said let there be and it was. And since then, there hasn't been anybody that can speak things, you know. And so it's a popular thing to hear it. It sounds good. Really, I can, I can, I can have the money and whatever I need, you know. And I can have money and healing and whatever, you know, just by speaking it. Oh, yeah, yeah. The other thing that they teach that, that really kind of pushed me over the edge was that he teaches, um, the guy's name Bill Johnson. And he literally said this, that Yeshua completely divest, divested himself of his divinity when he came to earth. That he was not God in the flesh, that he had put that off. He, he was 100% man. In fact, he goes on to say, that this is a quote, Jesus was one of the most normal Christians who ever lived. Bill Johnson, yeah. That he was one of the most normal Christians, that he actually went to hell to atone for our sins. And that he died a spiritual death and had to be reborn. Quote, Jesus was the first born again man. And he had to be saved. He was born again. Okay. Now what they're doing. Some sects of Adventism came very close to that doctrine. At one point when they taught this second death theory. that and we, Several of us in here came out of Adventism. They taught that Yeshua paid the price for our sins by going to hell. The Greek word does not mean hell. The your word that's used there was when he was in, he was buried and he was in the hell for three days. That's not even what that word means. It's a Greek word that basically means the realm, the place of the dead. Which it can be the grave, it can be, you know, and it's blended with the Greek thought of they're dead. You know, we don't know where they are. But it literally doesn't mean hell. It literally is more in Hebraic thought it means the grave. So, what's interesting is the penalty, the atonement process wasn't for us, you know, you, you can't go to hell and be atoned for. You know, the atonement is you need perfect blood sacrifice. That's why for thousands of years the pictures of the sacrifice for atonement are a perfect sacrifice, right? It's not going to hell and being punished. And okay, you've been punished enough. Now you're redeemed. You know, somebody can go be punished enough for you and you're redeemed. That is not, that does not hold water biblically. What, I don't just, you know, I keep flashing back to the rabbi in the parking lot at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's like, that no man could die for your sins. I'm like, well, who would it have to be? It has to be God. Not that he has to be punished for your sins. He has to die for your sins. So how can, the only perfect being is God, right? And Yeshua said in Mark 12, 29, Listen to me, Israel. The Lord our God is one. And you shall love him with all your heart and shoulder and strength. And we did that. Okay. Part of the Shema. Okay. And that's Deuteronomy 6, 4. He's quoting. He didn't make that up. That's not new. It's just true. Okay. So, how do you... But it's, the Bible says God is a spirit. He's eternal. He's ever-present. He's outside of time. How can you kill God? You can't kill God. You can't resurrect God. He's a spirit. So, he has to come in the flesh. And so, contrary to what Bill Johnson teaches, he did not divest himself of his divinity. In fact, in Colossians it says, In him, in Yeshua, dwelt the fullness of the deity bodily. Okay? Now, your, most of your Bible is going to say Godhead. You can look it up in Greek or just go ahead and mark that out because it doesn't say anything about God or his head. The word there is theos or theose, which is the Greek word, the standard Greek word for divinity. It's just how you say divinity or, or God. Yeah, theos, you know, it's like theology, it's where it comes from, it's Godology, theos, okay, or theose. So, 
In him dwelt the fullness of the deity in a bodily form. He is the image of the invisible God. Paul goes over and over and over explaining this. So God steps into flesh, never sins, you know, and then dies and spills his blood as atonement. That's what it required. The life is in the blood. It requires a blood sacrifice. Not go, there, was no hell, there was no atonement where, okay, you've burned enough, so that's good, you know. It was perfection, perfect blood, life of the blood, okay. And then he got to prove that he was who he said he was, and it's one of the most, it's one of the most um, documented phenomenons in history is the resurrection of Yeshua. And I shared with somebody the other day at a funeral, um, well, I shared with the audience, I shared with everybody that would listen, that, you know, just some of the physical evidence of the resurrection of Yeshua. And some of the most powerful evidence is the people that were against him. These pagan Roman um, historians wrote about it. Tacticus wrote about it. Josephus wrote about it. I mean, these people that didn't believe anything about that wrote about it. Your calendar, the world, the, basically the most of the world changed the way we keep time based on that event, the resurrection of Yeshua. You know, it's like something happened. that wasn't normal. <laughs> yeah. and, and we either reject him or, you know, we accept him or reject him. But um, that was the requirement. And so to teach something contrary to that, we got to be really, really, really quite... Uh, uh, we, uh, we first said we rejected a couple of songs. There's one, and, and uh, we love the beat, we love all that. But um, um, it says, no, no, out of the ashes we rise. How does that song start out? Dun, 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 dun. Out of the ashes we rise. No, no, that's, uh, that's, I maybe got the wrong song. Um, how, what's the word? No, no, uh, that's the wrong song. That's the wrong song. I'm trying to think. No, that's the wrong song. It's the, anyway, so the whole thing, the whole story is basically, um, no, it's not that song. It's not, yeah, that's a completely different song. It's a, it's a, um, it's a Bethel song. And that was one of the first ones we took off because it basically says that our hope is in arising from the... Keep going. It said, yes, pray. How does it go? How does the tune go? God's demon took it from him. But get to that point. Because I, I want you to look at that word. I want you to... Hope will arise. Death is defeated. Our king, the king is alive. Alright, now just hold on there. Out of the ashes, hope will arise. Who was burned? Your, our hope will arise. Out of the ashes, our hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. That is not the story of Yeshua. That is the pagan story of the phoenix. That story has been around forever. And they meshed it right in the middle of that song. Now I could rewrite that song. Up from the grave our hope did arise. Death was defeated. Our king is alive. It was right there. It was right there. And somebody perverted it. Somebody perverted that song. In fact, I, I, I wonder if the person who originally wrote the original, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's why we don't sing it anymore. It's, it's, it's the, you know the story of the phoenix. You know, the phoenix is this mythical bird. It's where you get the, you know, even it's the firebird, like the emblem on the Pontiac firebird. That's what that thing is. It's a phoenix coming out of the ashes and every 500 years, that, 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 that is a whole pagan thing. It's Greek. It's Greek mythology. Why in the world would we mix and so what does the enemy do? It's never straight up, let's, let's worship Satan. You know, we're not going to listen to that. But everything's good and there's a little subtle, subtle, subtle teaching in there. You've got to be careful. And I'm saying, so not only, and I, I love picking on the internet because it's just like the, it is the tree of perversion today. Um, that, that is, is, I mean, it's, it's dangerous. But what's even more dangerous is when you get people who have left people who have left basic biblical doctrine and got these incredible worship bands and and use that to lure people in and I love the tunes I love the music I love their their ability is incredible you know but it's the words that matter Satan and I was thinking about that this morning like who was probably the greatest musician to ever live Satan himself 
He was so cool that he was built. He's musical. He's got pipes and everything built right into him. He is the band, you know. He shows up, you know. And so uh, it would make sense that that's, that has always... Wayne, I'll tell you, he was in the music business for years. I mean, is Satan involved in the music business, Wayne? I mean, he can tell you some stories, I'm telling you. It's like he's always been in it. Not, not him. Satan's always been in the music business. He's always been part of the deception. He's always been part of the distortion. And he's always used it against unsuspecting people. I'm sorry, I ranted and raved. Go on. Right here. On the side, um, when I was a little girl, because I was born and raised in New York, and um, I remember in my building there, there was a, a couple, they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I remember being attracted to them, and they were—they looked different. The man wore this hat that was really wide, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and he had the little curls, and, and he had this black jacket, mm -hmm. and he, that's what I—and I remember being attracted to them, but I never dared say hello to them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my son one day comes out and says to me, "Hey, mom, why do I have a Jew nose?" So I said, "Honey, you have a Greco-Roman nose, not a Jew nose." So anyway, on the side about a year ago, I decided to go to Ancestry.com because they had it on sale <laughs> and, and decided to have a DNA test done. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was a shocker because mm -hmm. it said that 51% of my DNA came from Spain and Portugal and they even gave me the location of the place. So then I go and do my research mm -hmm. and it says that I came from the town where the Sephardites were prominent. Well. They were Jews. They right, were right. Jews. Yeah, they were. And then it also said that 3% of my blood was Orthodox Jew. And I told <laughs> this to my son, and he said, oh, well, that explains it, Mom. <laughs> but anyway, it, it brought that to my mind because you said that we are grafted mm -hmm. into the, into the, I guess, Israel is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And um, what I understand is, well, that, mind you, mm -hmm. I look, uh, guys, I, I don't have a Messianic congregation where I'm at, so when I come here, I really, really enjoy it. Yeah, you do. You plug in so, right and there. I have all these thousand and one questions. Okay. So sorry about that, but mm. when we, when you said that we're grafted, mm -hmm. and when we say that the, the ten tribes were dispersed, mm -hmm. and I would assume that at some point these, these descendants are going to are they going to return back to Israel? Or is it just in a spiritual sense? Um, a great question. So, um, yeah, that's, I could talk about that for the rest of the day. But um, both. They're going to turn, they are, they are returning. They will be part of the great return. There is about, there are, there is, there are about a dozen prophecies I can show you about the regathering of the tribes of Israel. Now, Orthodox Judaism today, Rabbinic Judaism teaches that it's already happened. Absolutely has not happened because one of the prophecies says that when this happens, you will no longer say Yahweh lives who brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage, but Yahweh lives who brought the children of Israel from around the nations and the four corners of the earth where he had scattered them. So every year I tell people, it's like, we're going to find out if this has happened. If I teach the book of Exodus in the Torah portion, it hadn't happened because that's what we're saying. We're still focusing on it. In other words, this event, when people recognize who they are and, and, and return, and man, I want to talk about this. <laughs> Just a, just a taste, just a taste. I'm going to get you going. I'm going to just give you enough to get going. See, when the enemy scattered Israel into the nations, he thought he was, he thought he was getting rid of them and leaves Judah and Benjamin, a little bit of Levi over here. Like, I got them. He scattered them. That's an agricultural term. He sowed them into the like nations. God seeds. says he did it. Satan thought he did it. God says, I did it. What happens when you sow seeds? They bring back a harvest. Okay. So, hallelujah, they're going, they go into the world and as they figure out, give me chill bumps, as they figure out who they go, you, if you look at where they went historically, those were the nations that became Christian nations. And now, the prophecy, the Malachi prophecy is, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to children. That's been the, that's been the Christian experience. The hearts of these men, unless you come as a little child, you can't have a part of me. It's been to humble ourselves. That's the part of the prophecy that, that, that uh, John quoted Okay, he said, "Turn the hearts." Or that Yeshua quoted about John. It was about John. That was John the prophet. Yeah. Was the 
he turned the hearts of, I think Yeshua said it about John, but he was going to turn the hearts of the fathers to children. And that was, that's the gospel message, okay? That we humble ourselves before the cross. You've heard it your whole life. He left off the second part of the prophecy because it wasn't time. The second part of the prophecy is about the second coming. And he, Yeshua does the same thing when he stands up in the church in Capernaum or in the synagogue. And the second part of the prophecy is turn the hearts of those fathers, those children who have turned their hearts to children, the fathers who turn their hearts to children, turn the hearts of those children back to their fathers. Who's their fathers? Biblically. You graft it in, remember. Right. When you turn your heart as a child, you become as a little child. Paul says you're grafted into Israel. And now the hearts of those children of God, of Israel, are turned back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now, as they return... It's not just the tribes that are returning. It's all the grafted nations. Of, uh, oh, it's going to be phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, It's big enough that God says, we ain't even going to talk about Egypt anymore. It's going to be one of the biggest things that ever happened in history. And that's right at the second coming. But anyway, that was way too much. And it was way off the Torah portion. <laughs> okay, so but have fun with it. A couple of things. Yes. Um, number one, about um, the three days in hell and the burning and all that. Okay, whatever. But first of all, does it not say in black and white on the page when Yeshua comes back, who is going to rise first? The dead. And then the dead what's going to happen? So no one has gone to hell yet. <laughs> well, no one has that. gone. <laughs> there is that. No, no, no one has gone to hell. No one has gone to heaven yet yeah, except really Yeshua. So, yeah. um, you know, there's that. There's that. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> that is an issue. <laughs> And then the other thing... I didn't thing, say I agreed with it. <laughs> the other thing I, I used wanted... to get mad at me because I didn't agree with it. <laughs> Go ahead. I wanted to say also about the music. I mean, obviously, music... I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, he, I agree with you. He probably is the most talented one at music mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Because you know how it is. Certain songs you hear and it's like you hear it and it just goes in. T you don't even have to realize. You could do mm -hmm. it subconsciously. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's so like hooking onto your soul. Mm -hmm. Depending on the type of music that you mm -hmm. listen to. And like you said, you have to be careful because it could be a song that is just like, you don't oh, even, Yahweh, Yahweh, you Yahweh. You don't even but notice what it's if saying. If it's just a one I mean, tiny that one song. little verse. Yep. Or one sentence even. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you know, that could change the entire meaning of the song. And it, now you're carrying that around with you. Yeah, yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So, I just wanted to say those couple things. All right. I've got a couple things. I, I'm going to get back to the cedar trees. In Numbers 24-4, mm -hmm. uh, Balaam, it, it's, God allows him to see and he's in a trance. Mm -hmm. And he says, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob? In the tabernacles of Israel, that's Israel, and mm -hmm. he compares them to this six. Mm -hmm. It says, "As the valleys are they spread forth, as mm -hmm. gardens by the river's edge side, mm -hmm. as the trees of line aloes which the Lord hath planted, and as the cedar trees beside the waters, mm -hmm. he shall pour water out of the buckets, and his seed shall be in the many waters." That's a that verse seed. right there. That's prophecy. Go ahead. Yeah, and his king shall be higher than Agog, and his kingdom shall be exalted. This is, now what's interesting here is the, the, he's speaking the words of, of Yahweh at this point, it says so. And he's, he's in agreement with Yahweh finally. He's like, okay, I'm not going to try to curse. I'm not going to do it. He did no enchantments. He just let God speak. Okay. And he actually, when in this part here, and we're in 24, uh, after 5, after verse 5, he describes some of the, um, the prophecies that were of Abraham. Okay, uh, of Jacob, some of the prophecies that Jacob, I mean, he blends all of this together. And, um, you know, like, you know, there's the one to Abraham, right in verse 9, he'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Um, but this one, he lies down and who, as a lion, and, you know, that's, that's Israel, that's Jacob blessing his sons there. Um, and so like all those prophecies towards Israel, he's speaking, but especially the one, verse 7, is actually what we're talking about with the scattering. It says, and his seed shall be as many waters. That's the tribes, that's who we call Ephraim, who's scattered, you know, uh, around the world, like water, you know, like, like, like rain, okay? And so, they, you know, and that's going to bring forth fruit. Go ahead. 
the more you talk, oh my goodness, the more things come to my mind. Um, I was afraid that was going to happen. I was talking to Norma. I think I mentioned it to Norma about a week or so ago, because I know I read in the in the Bible that um, I don't know if it says it says the Messiah will come and he will rule the nations mm -hmm. with a rod. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about that another time, because I want to spend some time with you on that subject about, and okay. then you're talking about the millennial reign. And oh, I don't know about that, but... That's I where just, that is. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, Got and it. that's why, you know, you asked me that question the other day, and... Yeah, but, um, so I I'm wondering how, did, how does it all fit in with... It's with too deep. Grafted. It takes too long. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I do... Uh, that actually fits into our revelation thing we're doing, so maybe we can get together sometime this week and talk about that. Um, um, but I'm, I'm running out of time today. Um, but basically, just keep in mind that as we're grafted in, Paul says that we become Israel. And this is really important. Get this. The prophecy was that we would turn back to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when you get, and Chris just, uh, Crystal, would you give her the mic for just a second? Let her explain this. Because it really hit her in a powerful way. I like the way she explained it. Go ahead. About being grafted in, what that means about Abraham, okay. Isaac, and Jacob. Um, well, I, I can just share the experience that I had. Um, I read, I was seven day Venice, read the scriptures and I started reading about Passover, okay? So I need to do Passover. So for like two years straight, did Passover and, you know, read what you're supposed to do, okay? We're supposed to retell the story. Um, of you know leaving Egypt so that our kids will know the story and you know that's a command and so we go through the story of Egypt and Keep it's it like close. our fathers our fathers um, brought us out of Egypt or you know we, we it was our fathers that did this and I kept thinking it's really not my father okay it was the Jews father okay it wasn't my father and when I realized, the time I realized that I am adopted, mm -hmm. my father is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It mm -hmm. is my father. Mm -hmm. Passover meant something totally, totally different. different. Mm -hmm. It became a part of me. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was not this, this, this thing I did that you know that that wasn't that somebody else was supposed to be doing it. It was for me, and mm -hmm. it was my father. You know that that came out of Egypt. I guess okay. yeah, is that yeah. what you? Yeah, I think I think so. Just when we realize that when you're adopted, we're, we're grafted in. That's another word for being adopted, right? So it doesn't have anything to do with your physical, you know, fathers. You know, it has to do with your spiritual fathers. When they're your spiritual fathers, they're your spiritual fathers. And now you can relate to this. This is not somebody strange. I'm not doing something over here different from what... I'm in God's family. That's what it's really talking about. We're in God's family. God's family has a name. It's Israel. Okay, the obedient... What, is God, what does Israel mean? Those who wrestle with God. Do you ever wrestle with God? I mean, he certainly wrestles with me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, my goodness, that's what it means. Go ahead, Wayne. Are you going to the end of the... I am, I'm doing it right now. Okay. Verse 15 through 18. No, got to hold that for next week. But we might give it a little, one little, yeah. So let me kind of end with this. Um... What's interesting is that Balaam, the, the, the sorcerer, turned prophet, turned... He's mixing. This is the problem. This dude is mixing. He has an opportunity here to repent and come clean. He knows who Yahweh is. He's speaking these powerful words that we even use today. And because they're God's words. But we know ultimately, and I think that's what Wayne's getting to, that he really doesn't do it. Um, I'll let you do 25, 1, and 2. Wayne. Um, but in verse 15 he says he takes up his oracle and says the utterance of Balaam the son of Beor and he da, 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 da. verse 17 says I see him but not now. This is talking about the Messiah. He sees because it told him in verse 14 he says I'm going to show you what will happen to your people in the latter days. 
Okay? So this is a latter day prophecy that he's about to give them. And so he goes through this and in verse 17 he says, it's about the Messiah. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. Okay? A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Shebet, the word there. And batter the brow of Moab and destroy the sons of Tumult. Okay, the sons of Seth. And Edom shall be a possessing Seir. So this is really talking about the second coming. Okay, this is talking about Yeshua, the Messiah. This has long been known, uh, accepted as a messianic prophecy um, by, by the Jews, by the Christians, by everybody. Um, Israel does valiantly out of Jacob, one shall have dominion. Okay, so, and destroy the remains of the city. And he will look on Amalek and took up his oracle because Amalek's going to be destroyed in the last days, of course. And so, but the, the interesting thing about this guy is God lets him prophesy all the way to the second coming, really. Um, and he really just talks about the destruction of Amalek, who are basically the people who are fighting against Israel right now, physically and spiritually. Um, and in 25, it, in the end of the portion, it says that Balak, Balaam uh, leaves and um, goes to his place, but there's more, and that's in chapter 25. And so Balaam didn't give up. I don't know if I should give this away. Because Balaam couldn't curse Israel. My question is, who can curse Israel? Israel can curse Israel. Rodney got it. Yes, Chris. Go ahead. Right along that line, I'd like to go back to um, verse 7. Okay. His king shall be higher than Agag. Mm -hmm. That's very significant because Agag was an Amalekite. Right. And David utterly wiped out the Amalekites there in his kingdom and Yeshua also is coming back when he comes back the same is to be true he's going to be higher than the Amalekites and his kingdom shall be exalted mm -hmm. interesting because that that term Agag was a very very powerful king uh, and it became it, it actually became a name that they call their kings because it, he was so exalted and basically we could translate it Pharaoh for the Amalekites. He'd be, he'd be like Pharaoh. So this is like his king, Israel's king, will be higher than Pharaoh is another way to look at that because we don't grasp what that word means, Agag. Yes? 2321. 2321, it also mentions a king and I think that would be Messiah. Yes, 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 yes. And the king is among them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, um, 22 is kind of a funny one right underneath that. Your King James there says that he has strength like a unicorn. You ever wonder where unicorns came from? There they are. Well, only that's not what the word means. Uh, uh, it's better translated as strength of a wild ox. It's an interesting word. Wild bull, wild ox. Like goodness. Come on, King Jimmy. You're better than that. Uh, no mythical creatures. So, um... Wayne, read 25, 1 and 2. And so what happened is, I, Balaam, we see from, from Peter that Balaam ultimately did get something. It's like, what did he do? What did he do? And, and Second Peter talks about that, that he ultimately did curse Israel, but he didn't do it. Read 25, 1 and 2, and that'll give you your answer, and then we'll, we'll stop there. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit holotry with the women of Moab, they invited the people to their sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Uh -oh. Flesh, 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 food, food, food. And yeah, that's what I was talking about earlier. We've got to be careful because it sounds good. You know, I am going to share something else. I'm sorry. I know it's time to go, but um, this is it. Two things just jumped out at me. We was looking last week in Revelation chapter 2. I just want to share a verse from there. You're going to see. I have a few things against you, he's saying up to um, the church of Pergamos. Maybe we didn't even get to that one. That's the third one. But we'll talk about that this week. A, with a few things against you. You hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. See, we, it doesn't tell us in the Torah what he did. In the book of Revelation, it's being revealed of what he did. It says, Balaam put, taught Balak. So Balaam taught the king. He didn't curse him. He said, look here. You can't curse Israel, but Israel can curse themselves. 
listen to me Israel, Shema Israel. The enemy can't curse you, but you can curse yourself. That is fundamental. That's Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30. Over and over and over and over it says this. So Balak, you know, Balaam lets the king in on his things. Look, here's all you got to do. They're going to curse their own self. He put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality. And you hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. And we talked about that a little bit. We'll talk about that on Wednesday night if we need to talk about that more. But that whole thing was about the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was that, oh, there's, almost this, there's all this freedom in Christ. You can do anything you want to do. Everything's done away with. You know, don't even worry about it. And they took it to the extreme where it involved sexual immorality because you're just forgiven for anything and everything you might ever do. It really doesn't say that. We have to repent, okay? And, and it's not that there's a lack of Yeshua's blood, but what there is is consequences for our actions, okay? Now, as far as, and, and as far as, I just want to sh go ahead, Wayne, real quick while I'm looking this up. I'm good. I, I, I'm, I'm still looking. I'm not even in the right book. Well, I will, you notice each time that, uh, they did with the, this process. It kept going higher yeah. to another place. If we get high enough, we'll be we'll be there. And and I think that the 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 the, the picture there was is that they saw they saw a little piece of Israel when he first mm -hmm. tried to cross right, him. Right, right. Then he went higher and saw more. Then he went higher and saw the whole valley, and mm -hmm. he went up higher even still to where you could see all of Israel encamped mm -hmm. and tried to the, the curses all the way. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't know where uh, the enemy roams to and fro and mm -hmm. goes up to heaven and talks to God. I don't mm -hmm. know how much of Israel he could see wherever he's at, but the picture's the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, to just kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah, I think and I think he's here now. I, don't, I really don't think he's able to do that anymore. But <laughs> but yeah, I mean, as and, and it was when when he finally saw all of Israel that he was overwhelmed. So just to, you know, uh, the, the, the thing that I think one of the things that I, I, I'm back on just for a second, I want to compare the prosperity doctrine where basically money, fame, no sickness. I mean, everybody wants that. Okay. Um, compared to, and this is what dawned on me, Yeshua's first sermon. Now we see him in Capernaum and he just read the the Torah portion and made one Dereshah, one comment about that. His first actual sermon that's recorded is in Matthew chapter 5. And he talks about blessings. And the blessings in Matthew chapter 5 is called the Beatitudes. And he starts out talking about the, the poor. Uh, poor in the spirit. The, um, those who mourn. Those who are meek. Blessed are those who hunger. Uh, blessed, are, you know, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure of heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted for the kingdom. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kind of evil things against you for falsely for my sake. You rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. For so they have persecuted the prophets who were before you. You're the salt of the earth. You know... That's just a wee bit contrary to name it and claim it. You know what I'm saying? I think the closest thing we're going to get to biblical, you know, I, I, we, it's, it's, it, you've got to keep it in balance. In other words, he's saying, don't worry about this. Quit, quit worrying about this. You know, it's, in fact, it goes on to say in one place, he says, in this world you will have tribulation. Not you might have or you can. He says, you will have tribulation. Okay? Um, and just rejoice, you know. Um, so uh, that's John, I wrote that down. Oh, John 3, 3, I think is where it says that. Um, I think. But, um, so, but the, the, the Torah promises us, God's instruction promises us blessings as a natural outpouring of obedience. If you walk here, you will be blessed. If you walk here, you will be cursed. You know, choose who you're going to serve. You got life and death. And by the way, if you can't figure this out, choose life. Okay? I mean, it's like, I know it's a crazy world, but just even though everybody's walking around with skulls on their head and their back and their motorcycle, 
I mean, really, why would you... Somebody said the other day, and I think it made a lot of sense, basically mocking things that make you nervous. Why would you be on a motorcycle, the most dangerous thing out there, and having skulls all over you? It's like you're begging for it. But what they're really doing, I think, is mocking it. You know, that's not going to happen to me. Okay? Until it does. Amen? Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, you're looking at a biker. So, it's not like I don't... And it's not like I haven't been run over by a truck. I have. Um, but praise Yahweh, I walked away from it, you know. And the bike was destroyed. So, um, our blessings will come from your salvation. Let me just be crystal clear. I shared with somebody just recently. I said, don't ever forget. It's always been about grace. It's always been about his mercy. And that's never going to change. I was, I was right there in Matthew. And, and Matthew 5, 17. Let me just read that. Sorry, I can't stop. He said, don't think, Yeshua speaking, don't think. This is right after that sermon, right at the end of that sermon. He said, don't even think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to pleuro in Greek. That word is used, typically that's the word, that's the standard used word that's used when a net is full of fish. Till it's breaking. When the net's full of fish and it's breaking, pleuro. Fish is the Hebrew word, the letter for life. Kai. Kai. It's a fish. You walk up to a pond. Is it death or is it life? If you walk up and you go, it's life. Living water. It has fish in it. That became the word for life. So it was like, he didn't come to do away with it. He came to give it life. He came to, and he says that literally. He came to have you to life and life more abundantly. It's not about salvation or anything like that coming from the Torah. It's simply blessings or curses that we understand. And that, so as a natural outpouring of our love for God, our love for Messiah, and our understanding of what's happened to us, that we just naturally desire to be obedient. Okay? And, and from that, there's blessings. That's where the blessings come from. Not from our faith in our faith. It's not if you believe it strong enough, it will happen. And I know we've all heard that, haven't we? You heard that? If you believe it strong enough. And if you didn't get it, it's just because you didn't believe it strong enough. <laughs> Faith is believing that God will do what he said he will do. And the Torah is the instructions of God. He will do that. And we're right in the middle of a really cool time period. You know. Thank you, Father, for this word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for this, this powerful picture of a bizarre prophet. Proof that you can speak through anybody. But at the same time, also proof that we always have choice. And even though this man spoke incredibly powerful words about Israel, he was still out to destroy them, and ultimately he was destroyed by Joshua. He did not survive this. So, Father, your word is true. That's Torah. He did not side with Israel. He ultimately tried to curse Israel, and he was destroyed by Yehoshua, who is a picture of the Messiah, Yeshua. Thank you for your word, Father, and I just pray for everybody here. I pray for all the folks that are listening on the line. I thank you so much for all you guys joining us. And just, I pray for Yahweh's Spirit to touch your hearts today, just like ours here. It's been a powerful uh, teaching. I, I praise you, Father, that your Spirit is here with us. And I just pray that safety on everybody that's here and listening as we travel this weekend. And uh, keep our mind and our eyes on you. And that's where blessings will come from. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua's name, we pray. Amen and amen. Shabbat. Shalom. Shalom.